The Tolkien Road, Episode 31, The Lord of the Rings, Book 1, Chapter 9, At the Sign of the Prancing Pony. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through the works and philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, we continue our discussion of The Lord of the Rings with Book 1, Chapter 9 of Fellowship, at the sign of the Prancing Pony, wherein we experience the town of Bree, meet the mysterious ranger Strider, see the ring play a trick, and are entertained by Frodo's rendition of The Man in the Moon. By the way, if you haven't already, please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes. We'd love to know what you think of the podcast. Enjoy the show. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Tolkien Road. With you, as always, I am John, and I am joined by my co-host, Greta. Greta, how are you? I am super duper. Keeping it real? You know it. Keeping always it and forever. Keeping it real Tolkien style? Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Can't you tell by the crickets in the background? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying something... We're trying out just uh, going the full Monty. Yeah. You know, we've been having the crickets from uh, from inside with the window open, and right. tonight we were just kind of like, you know what? Let's uh, let's do this. Let's just go for it. You know. Yeah. Right. So go big or go home. Yeah, go big or go home. So uh, hopefully the crickets aren't just completely overwhelming. Um, <laughs> but or distracting. Yeah, and. As a consequence, we're also a little closer to the recording device, so mm. um, hopefully, you know, it's not like picking up every little sniff and, you know, um, just s- <laughs> sound of the salivary, you know, gland moving as we <laughs> as we sit out here and talk. But uh, we'd have some feedback actually oh. that um, Greta needs to speak up. Yeah, Greta. I do. You need I... to be louder. Well, now I'm worried about my salivary glands being completely obnoxious, so... Well, you should be, because <laughs> you have some obnoxious salivary glands. Wow. No, just look, you know, look for that little red light there, uh, in case if you'll see the little red light blink if it uh, if we're being too loud, I guess you could say. Okay. But I think right now we're talking at a pretty good volume. So, awesome. Um, yeah, so on this episode, we shall be discussing uh, Book 1, Chapter 9 of... The Lord of the Rings, at the sign of the prancing pony. The sign of the prancing pony. Isn't yeah. it weird to be at a sign of something? Yes. Right. I mean, I, don't you think of being yes. more like at a place, whereas a sign is a thing. You know what I'm saying? You think of it being like I'm at my house, or mm-hmm. I'm at the beach, right? You don't think of being at a sign. Hmm. It just yeah. struck me today when I was reading it again. I was like, it's weird to be at a sign. Like, they just stand at a sign. I just think... So you can be at a stop sign, I guess. I just think it's a way of speaking. I mean, you know, it's like, um, it's, it's, it, I think it's a little more dramatic sounding than just saying at the prancing pony, you know? Um, I think so. I think to say at the sign of the prancing pony, we it's almost like they're standing outside and like at a crossroads, you know, like, do we go in or do we mm. not, you know? Okay. I, can I don't see know. That. That's, that's my thought. That makes sense. I mean, I see what you're saying, but yeah, I hadn't thought of that. No, I like Good. that. I like Good. that explanation. Good. I like your, give yourself a pat on the back for some critical thinking there, Greta. But I only came up with a thought. I didn't come up with the answer. You came up well, with the answer. But- Good questions lead Was to it good a good answers. Question? Thanks. Let's give yourself not too, loud. Oh, not, not too loud. Not too loud. Remember. Sorry if that just blew out an eardrum or two. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty soft. I think you're okay. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna be talking about chapter nine at the sign of the prancing pony tonight. And um, hey, by the way, I just recently posted an article on TrueMyths.org. TrueMyths.org. Yeah. You want to know what the article That's is your about, blog. Greta? I have a feeling you've already told me. Maybe not. Is it about music? 
why don't you simply ask me, hey, John, what's that article about? <laughs> oh, I'm about? sorry. I didn't, I didn't follow that setup very man. well. <laughs> Yikes. I'm a little rusty. We are 31 episodes in, and still it's 31? like... 31? And still it's like, you know... Why did we not have a party at number 30? I mean, I'm, I, you know, we're, we need that, like, you know, Johnny and Ed kind of synergy going on. We need that, like, you know... Who are Johnny Conan, and Ed? Oh, you're Conan talking about Johnny Carson? And Andy, you know... Conan and Andy. Oh, okay. Thing. Wayne and Garth. Right? Oh, right. We are supposed to be the Wayne's World of Tolkien podcast, you know. Right. So, okay. So, let me try again. Let's try again. Okay. Do over. What was I talking about? Your The article you just posted. On oh, True yeah. Myth. What was that article about again? I don't know, John. Why don't you tell us? What is the article about? Hmm. I'm glad you asked, Greta. So, the article I wrote was about... Um, it's, it's actually in this ongoing series of articles on doing the Silmarillion as a film or maybe some, some other kind of oh, visual Oh, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. And this one, so I actually published one two weeks ago that was about why the right way to do the Silmarillion on film, it would require nine films, three right. trilogies, a right. lot of movies. Right. This one is about how I'd actually break that down and how I'd do each movie. Oh, right? neato. Okay. So, um, so I encourage everybody to go over there and check it out. And, uh, you know, it's just, just kind of a fun little process of going through the entire Silmarillion and saying, okay, where are the big stories here to, you know, that I could actually turn into a film. Right. And, um, yeah. That sounds very cool. I'll yeah. have to check that out. Right on. Thanks for telling me about it. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I encourage everyone else reading to check it out. Too. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you know, we've reached that point in the podcast where it is, oh, what's that? <gasps> I think I, think, I hearken. I think you know what time it is. Is it haiku time? That's right. It is. Haiku time. Even the crickets are getting down. I know. They're sinking up. Pow. Haiku time. You know, this yeah, moth yeah. over here, I think, was dancing a little bit, too. Nice. nice. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so who went first last time? You did. I did, so yeah. your turn to go I'll first. go first. Yep, yeah, I'll go first. All right, so here's my haiku. Prancing like the horse on the end sign, Frodo jumped into a real mess. Mm. It's pretty good, huh? I think so, yeah. Can I read it again? Yeah. Because sure. I hadn't read it in a while, and I think I can read it better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Prancing like the horse on the inn's sign, Frodo jumps into a real mess. Yeah. Nice. I've gotten into using similes in my haikus lately. I like that. You know, I hadn't thought of that little um, connection there, but it's like, you know, the prancing pony kind of mm -hmm. brings out the the prancing pony and Frodo, That's and he's right. getting up on the table singing his singing, his, singing his Man in the Moon song. Yes, I uh, love the Man in the Moon song. Yeah, I wish I knew the music for it. Yeah. It's the same as the REM version. Oh. Yeah. Why did I not figure that out? Yeah, if you just if you actually just sing those words with the REM Man in the Moon song in mind, then it actually works out really well. If you believe. Yeah. You didn't realize that Tolkien wrote that song? I did not. Yeah. He actually wrote the tune, but, you know, R.E.M. did their own version of the lyrics. So. Are you being serious right now? <laughs> no, I'm not okay. being serious. Okay. <laughs> I can't. Because <laughs> you, you kind of, I thought you were kidding, but then there was, like, this certain moment where Well, and you know my whole, sure you know my whole thing about, you know, joking about how Bob Dylan wrote every, every yes, song in the last yes, 50 yes, years, yes, you know? yes. Which, so you know, you sometimes find out the song, a certain song was by Bob Dylan. You're like, wait, that's by Bob Dylan? What? Yeah. You know, and he actually, you know, he, they didn't make the song famous. Somebody else did, but he wrote right. the song. But right. Yeah, so I thought that would be a funny little. That is funny. Yeah. Anyway, so singing the Man in the Moon song. So I like it. Good yeah. good haiku. Good Thank haiku. you. I nice appreciate little, it. Nice done. Um, I went a little different angle with my haiku. Okay. Though their grandeur hath dimmed. Still rangers ride, regal as great kings of yore. Oh. Wow. You did go a different direction. Yeah. You're like breaking out Middle English and everything. <laughs> because of yore? Yes. 
Well, didn't you use another word in there too? Regal. Regal. No, the Grandeur. other one. Grandeur. Half. No, of what was it? Grandeur of. Huh? Read the first line again. Though their grandeur hath dimmed. Though their grandeur hath dimmed. I think it's just because I'm saying it. I think that's. I think so maybe fancily. that is. I think. I think that's right. I think it's more of your presentation. Though, and I raised my hand. You did. My right arm as I said it. And then a feather as like if appeared. Raised, as if raised to the heavens. A feather right. appeared like in your hair. Though their grandeur hath dimmed. Yes. Still ranges ride, regal as great kings of yore. That makes it sound like old English. I was going to say, that makes it sound like Shakespeare. Yeah. But that was wonderful. I really like that. Thank you. I really, really like that. Good. Well, we had some other folks submit haiku. We had Josh. Josh, super fan. Super, super fan, super number super one. Super fan, number one. Um, all right, so here we go. Josh's haiku. The pony parties, like Moss Isley Cantina, men, dwarves, and hobbits. All right. Wait, do, you, do you know the reference? Out the um, extra, the outside of Tolkien reference he made there. Of course. What? Wayne's World. No. Oh. <laughs> what did you, what'd you think was Wayne's World? The thing about the cantina. No. Uh, that wasn't. They didn't go to cantina in Wayne's <laughs> World. Honestly, I thought that was Wayne's World. Well, it seems like a very Wayne's World thing is, to do to go is, to a cantina. Who is Who is Josh standing with in his Twitter picture? Stormtrooper. From. Star Wars. Yeah, Moss Eisley Cantina is, is a locale in Star Wars. Is it an actual cantina? Yeah. Like you can go and drink margaritas and eat tacos? Well, the Star Wars universe equivalent of margaritas and tacos. Okay. Yeah. Can you read it again now that I know that? Sure. The pony parties, like Moss Eisley Cantina, men, dwarves, and hobbits. That's cool. Yeah. I like that one. Yeah. Thanks it's actually, I don't know if you remember it from the, from the Star Wars... By the way, Greta hadn't even seen the Star Wars movies when we. Like, no, I did. I had did to. We, ra- did I, had watch- to, I had to watch Return of the Jedi. Oh. For a paper that yeah, I wrote can't, in English. You can't watch Return of the Jedi. Like, I fell asleep in the, the middle of it two. anyway. So. So messed up. Yeah. So it's, it's a good thing this isn't. A what Star kind Wars of podcast. English teacher assigns a paper that you have to? That that the pa- the assignment for the paper is to watch Willow, and Return of the Jedi. And write a paper. Comparing and contrasting them. An awesome English teacher. Like a lame English teacher. Both of those movies were horrible. There was a third one too. I can't remember what it was. Do you so wanna, I think I do you, do the you want thing. to keep Josh as our super fan? I do want to keep. I'm sorry. I need to stop talking. You need to like watch those movies again through the eyes of your children. Maybe like I with do. them. See, I never watched them as a child. I was in high school when I watched them for the first time. My brothers weren't into them. Yeah. And neither was, you know, nobody, nobody that I knew was really into them, except my weird cousin. You hadn't even seen Back to the Future. No, I, I lived a very sheltered childhood. When we got married. I mean, like, we had to go through, like, we just had to spend, like, basically the first year of our marriage watching movies from the <laughs> 80s. That I grew- Thankfully, you yeah. had seen Karate Kid. Well, I also spent part of the 80s in Germany. Yeah. Where that stuff just wasn't really readily available. I don't know. Is that true? Yeah. Because they, they would all play in German, like at the theaters. Oh, I see. But you knew German. I know, but... Your story's insane. breaking down. <laughs> I think you were really a communist spy from that time and during that time. Yikes. Uh-oh. You're just trying to hide it. Witness protection. <laughs> Get me out of here. Oh. All right. Yeah, I probably should watch them again. All right. I think that's a great haiku, uh, Josh. That is really good. So... Um, I really like how you throw, you know, I, I hadn't thought of that connection, but it really is like with the Moss Eisley Cantina and, you know, all the different aliens that are in there. And then you've got men, dwarves, and hobbits all together in the Prancing Pony. So I like that. I like Pretty that cool. you put a simile in there, Josh. Yes. We simile people got to stick together. Simil- similarians. Similarians. Similar- I was trying to think if it was in, if I could turn it into a noun. Simil- simile lovers. Sil- Silmarillions. <gasps> What? <laughs> oh my goodness! Not. Wow. All right. Okay, Mary Grace. Thank you, Josh. That was next. wonderful. Ooh, Mary Grace got one in. Yeah, Yay. she got three in. Mary oh, Grace. Let me tell you something. Mary Grace like blew my mind this time. Like, Woo! This, she, she had three haiku and she had she submitted a long poem that what? I'm gonna read as well because I mean if you're gonna write a long poem for our podcast and I got to read it on the air. You got to read it. So. Yes. All right, let me read your haiku first. 
Okay. In the warm tavern, through a slight slip of a took, Bilbo's trick replays. One more time. In the warm tavern, through a slight slip of a took, Bilbo's trick replays. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. I like the slight slip of a took. I know. I like that alliteration. Me too. Me it's too. It's really good. I like how she draws the connection with Bilbo, Bilbo's little trick, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I actually wrote one of my haiku that I oh, didn't yeah, read. Oh, yeah. She said Bilbo's trick, not Frodo's yeah. trick. Oh, nice. I, I like it. I did the same thing with one of my haiku, but not, not the exact same haiku, obviously, but um, I drew a parallel with Bilbo's birthday. Ah. Uh, and, and the mine. one that you did not read? Right. Tonight? Yeah, I'll put it on the available air. available on the, on the website. On the website. Yeah. That's uh, really good, Mary Grace. We also had Roman um, submit a haiku. Roman is a new submitter of haiku. Sweet. Um, he submitted two, so I'm going to read one of his. Okay. Prancing pony found a nice meal enjoyed. Frodo is yanked to shadow. Oh. Nice. Yeah. I like that. Me too. Yanked to shadow. Yanked I like it. to shadow. Yeah. yeah. Well done, Roman. Yeah. Good job. All right, here's Mary Grace's long poem. All right. Okay. Should I get comfortable? Is it, like, really, really long? It's it's kind of long. It'll probably take a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Let's All right. do it. Go big or go home. Once four hobbits, called halflings of old, were traveling with a ring of gold. They had barely escaped whites and a willow, and now they wanted food and a pillow. Tom Bombadil told them of an inn, the prancing pony owned by a barleyman, where they could find rest and food and drink. Down into a bed at last they could sink. At dinner the hobbits all gathered round, in the common room with big folk they could be found. And a fool of a took forgot what he heard. Of my name, which is Baggins, you must not say a word. This took was comically describing Bilbo's party, of the dance and the food and the wine so hearty. He was giving the speech in quite a good mimic, but Strider to Frodo said, You better do something quick. So Frodo leapt up and began to talk, while Strider and Corner watched him like a hawk. Eventually, the crowd shouted for a song, so Frodo began one that was silly and long. A little dog laughed to see such fun, the Saturday dish went off at a run, and as the cow jumped over the moon, Frodo vanished from the middle of the room. A few suspicious men went out, while for Barleyman the others shouted about. Then Baggins was visible again next to Strider. I must speak with you, he said, maybe of black riders. So we come to the end of this mysterious tale, and as we do, please don't set up a wail. Just remember this, please, when in front of a crowd, don't disappear, don't vanish, suspicion will abound. That's awesome. Yeah. That is really, really good. Well done, Mary Grace. I kind of feel like, um, like she just pretty much summarized the chapter for us right there, so I kind of... Yeah, I think we can just end right there. Yeah, I think we just end this episode right there with that one. That was a so. perfect summary. Good I job. don't think I can add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, that was, no, that was, that was we're not, obviously we're not going to stop, but that was really good, Mary Grace. <laughs> great great stuff. That was really, really good. Um, I love it. Can I give love you, it. like, an air high five? Virtual air like, high virtual, fu- that's virtual air for. future high five. Virtual air future high five. So now she has to, hopefully she was ready for that, but if she's not, she has to rewind now and actually receive the high five. Well, or we could just do another one. Yeah. Virtual air high five. Whoosh. There you go. Nice. 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 Thanks, Mary Grace. And Roman and Josh, you guys really outdid yourselves this week. Yes. Good job. Yes, indeed. Good stuff. So, um, good job on the poetry tonight, everyone. Um, mm-hmm. So, favorite passages. Favorite, favorite passages. passages time. Yep. What did you, th- you have? Um, well, honestly, I couldn't pick one. Oh. And so what I did was I just, like, randomly opened to a page and closed my eyes and let my finger drop down. And you know what's interesting is it landed on what I probably would have picked if I had been forced at gunpoint to pick, which well, I kind of was. You were? Not really. No. I was being dramatic. Um, but I... It was basically the... The, um... The song... Oh, okay. And yeah. kind of the the event leading up to it. Uh huh. Um, let me see. I wrote down the page number. I was organized this time. We need more candles out here. Well, you can use your phone. I left my phone inside. All right, here it is. Oh, here you go. Here, here, here. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right, it starts. 
here. Well, let me see. So everyone in the room was now looking at him. I'll let Frodo. Mm -hmm. A song, shouted one of the hobbits. A song, a song, shouted all the others. Come on now, master, sing us something that we haven't heard before. For a moment, Frodo stood gaping. Then, in desperation, he began a ridiculous song that Bilbo had been rather fond of, and indeed rather proud of, for he had made up the words himself. It was about an inn, and that is probably why it came into Frodo's mind just then. Here it is in full. Only a few words of it are now, as a rule, remembered. I'm just going to read the first two stanzas. Okay. I thought they were the funniest. There is an inn, a merry old inn, beneath an old gray hill, and there they brew a beer so brown that the man in the moon himself came down one night to drink his fill. The ostler has a tipsy cat that plays a five-string fiddle, and up and down he runs his bow, now squeaking high, now purring low, now sawing in the middle. I just loved it. Yeah. It was just like, and I really liked as it goes on, I don't want to read the whole thing, but I love that he mentions the man in the moon, and he's obviously making a play on the nursery rhyme. Mm-hmm. Right, the hey diddle diddle, the cat in the fiddle, the cow jumps over the moon, the little dog I, laughs. I mean, I, such a sight. I assume, but like, I don't know, I don't know the history of that particular um, nursery rhyme. Yeah, I don't. I, I, maybe you're right. I just I don't know at all. Like, if anybody has done a study on that and um, how far back that whole nursery rhyme goes. Oh, and so whether, you think maybe Tolkien wrote this before the nursery rhyme? No, I don't. I think he. I think he took some of it from some old like folk nursery rhyme. Yeah. But I just haven't done any of the research on it, like to see um, to see if he came up with what what things he came up with and what things he didn't. I see. So. I got gotcha. you. Well, I think the thing about about uh, brewing a beer so brown that the mm-hmm. man in the moon himself came down to drink a fill. I think that's my favorite line in the whole yeah. song. Yeah. So clever and so witty. Um. So, and I can just kind of picture. Maybe it's because of the movie, but I felt like I could just picture Frodo dancing on the table. I'm trying to think of like this song. I'm trying to think of this as the R.E.M. song now. Let's see. <laughs> there is an inn, a merry old inn beneath an old gray hill and there they brew a beer so brown that the man in the moon himself came down. The ostler has a tipsy mm. cat that plays a five string fiddle and up and down he runs his bow now squeaking high, now purring low. Oh, so you're skipping the last line. Oh uh, yeah, I'm trying to see if it would work out. I could probably make it work out, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna torture our listeners anymore with that. Sorry, sorry, that was probably really lame to listen to. I do apologize. <laughs> I just, I just, well, had, I just had to humor myself. Well, All right. Good. At least you have the haiku song to preserve your reputation no, as a true. musician. That's true. Yeah, I'm, hopefully my reputation as a musician is not hinging on that little <laughs> that performance. Well, I'm just saying, um, at least you have that to cling to. And no, I mean, that, that 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 poem is obviously kind of a highlight of the chapter. Yeah. And, um, really, really clever, really fun. And mm-hmm. again, it's just, you know, this first whole book of Fellowship is kind of, it's kind of weird in that way. It's, yeah. you know, it's about... Things things are about to get so serious, and they really already are. You know, mm-hmm. They got these black riders on their trail, and mm-hmm. you know they were almost swallowed by a willow, and you know they were almost buried alive by barrel whites, and mm-hmm. all this crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, but at the same time, there's like funny little nursery rhyme kind of songs going on, and right. um, I don't know. It's just it's this really interesting synthesis of different different styles and different words. Yes. Well, anyway, I picked a. Um, I picked a, uh, another passage towards the end of the chapter. Okay. Um, this is the argument that Butterbur has with Mr. M- Mr. Mugwort. What a name. Meanwhile, an argument was going on by the fireplace. Mr. Butterbur had come trotting in, and he was now trying to listen to several conflicting accounts of the event at the same time. I saw him, Mr. Butterbur, said a hobbit, or leastways I didn't see him, if you take my meaning. He just vanished into thin air, in a manner of speaking. You don't say, Mr. Mugwort, said the landlord, looking puzzled. Yes, I do, replied Mugwort, and I mean what I say, what's more. There's some mistake somewhere, said Butterbur, shaking his head. There was too much of that Mr. Underhill to go vanishing into thin air, or into thick air, as is more likely in this room. Well, where is he now, cried several voices. How should I know? 
He's welcome to go where he will, so long as he pays in the morning. There's Mr. Took now. He's not vanished. Well, I saw what I saw, and I saw what I didn't, said Mugwort obstinately. And I say there's some mistake, repeated Butterbur, picking up the tray and gathering up the broken crockery. So I just like that. I like I like the, uh, you know, Mugwort and like his kind of his obstinate arguing mm-hmm. with Mr. Butterbur. And like, mm-hmm. you know, he's just like, I mean what I say. What and yeah, you know, Butterbur is just kind of like, oh, you don't say. And Mugwort's like, I do. You, uh, yes, I do. And I mean what I say. What's more? Mm-hmm. And then he's like, well, I saw what I saw and I saw what I didn't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> Whatever that means. But actually it does. I mean, when I read, when you read that by itself, it's like, what does that mean? But then you read it in context and you're like, well, he's saying like he knows he saw what he didn't see, which was he didn't oh, see Frodo. Oh, he didn't see Frodo. Right, right. I see. right, right, right. Okay. So. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah it's fine. So. I like the part about how there was too much. There was too much of that Mr. Underhill to vanish into right, thin air. Right, right. <laughs> what would be like, if Frodo overheard him, be like, what, you calling me fat? Yeah. What's yeah. your deal, dude? Yeah. 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 The, in other descriptions, you know, Frodo is not exactly the, uh, you know, the, the skinny... Elijah right. Wood guy, right. you know that yes. that he is in the Peter Jackson movies. Although, right. although I really like Elijah Wood, Elijah Wood's portrayal of Frodo is yes, it's I not exactly who Frodo was in the books, you know. Um, so, right. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, that was my favorite passage. I like Frodo. it. Yeah. Good choice, John. Thanks. You're welcome. So, um, so yeah, what did you? Oh, you know what? What? Before we discuss any more of this chapter. I have to make a couple of corrections from last episode because okay. um, I really didn't do a good job of of researching the whole Barrow thing before the episode, right? Okay. Um, but uh, Superfan Josh actually hooked me up with a um, uh, a little screen capture from uh, this book called the Tolkien Dictionary. Mm. And how do you not own this book, John? Well, I gotta look it up and, and see what this book actually is, but um, here's what it says about the Barrow Whites. Um, hey, refresh my memory. The Barrow White, oh, that was like the thing that swallowed yeah. them, right? No, 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 the old man Willow swallowed them. The Barrow no. White was the, was oh, the thing that, that captured was, them. that's right, the thing that right. ca- and then tied them up. Right. That's right, okay. Here's what it says. For many ages, the Barrow Downs were sacred and revered until out of the witch, out of the witch kingdom of Angmar, many terrible and tortured spirits fled across Middle-earth desperately seeking to hide from the ravening light of the sun. Demons whose bodies had been destroyed looked for other bodies in which their evil spirits could dwell. And so it was that the Barrow Downs became a haunted and dreaded place. Mm. The demons became the Barrow Whites, the undead, who animated the bones and jeweled armor of the ancient kings of men, who had lived in this land in the first age of the sun. The Barrow Whites were of a substance of darkness that could enter the eye, heart, and mind, or crush the will. They were form shifters and could move from shape to shape and animate whatever life form they wished. Most often, a Barrow White came on the unwary traveler in the guise of a dark phantasm whose eyes were luminous and cold. The voice of the figure was at once horrible and hypnotic. Its skeletal hand had a touch like ice and a grip like the iron jaws of a trap. Once under the spell of the undead, the victim had no will of his own. In this way, the Barrow Whites drew the living into the treasure tombs on the downs. A dismal choir of tortured souls could be heard inside the Barrow. As in the green half-light, the Barrow Whites laid his victim on a stone altar and bound him with chains of gold. Um, mm. So, you know, good stuff on on what the Barrow Whites yeah. really are. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, I, you know, I looked up the bar- the whole, which what is a barrow, mm-hmm. you know, in the first right. place. And so a barrow was basically like a, a burial mound. Like, That's what we talked about that so a We talked bit, about that we? a little bit, yeah. but um, I looked at it, I mean, I, I guess it's a pretty common term, okay. you know, before our time, I right? See. And this was, okay. you know, it was like sort of a, um, you, you know, I mean, you know, like the Egyptians built big pyramids for like their kings and like buried them in these, you know, huge tombs. Right. And I think it was just, I think it was sort of a similar idea, maybe on a smaller scale, uh, building a bunch of, you know, building like kind of a house underground okay. for the dead. I see. Um, okay. And, um... So, what was I going to say for, oh, um, and what was really interesting was, you know, I, I got this book to, uh, uh, that I've been wanting to read, um, and it's part of the Chronicles of Pridane, which probably some of our readers have read, mm-hmm. um, but it's called The Book of Three, and uh, it's sort of, you know, it's basically a fantasy novel. Right, um, right. And, 
and like in one of the first chapters that I read, it mentions a barrow, oh, right? It, mentions, okay. it was like a burial mound. So it just I happened to see. pop up when I was reading that today. Very cool. So anyway, hmm. just wanted to make sure I got that out there because okay. there are probably some people out there that are like, geez, this guy doesn't even know what a barrow is. What the heck is he doing doing a Tolkien podcast? <laughs> so um, now I know. Now I stand corrected. Now we all know. Thanks to Superfan Josh, yes, who is always you. willing to lend a helping hand. So, so shape shifters, huh? Yeah. Those are creepy. That's like what was in um, that show that we watched. Which one? You know, that sci-fi one. Um, Fringe. Weren't there shapeshifters in Fringe? I think so. So maybe they got that idea from Tolkien. Oh no! I mean, shapeshifters have been around. Another thing. I mean, may, maybe oh, they really? got that idea from Tolkien. I don't think they did. Though. <laughs> um, Wishful thinking. Yeah. Hello, moth. There goes my moth friend. He was hanging out. Maybe he has a message from Gandalf. Part. Kinda looks like he does. Yeah. He's flying all around us. Oh, now he's gone. He's like, oh, I don't want to talk to these guys. These guys will screw it up. Let me go find somebody else. Somebody else is more helpful. <laughs> he's going to know where Barrow is. He <laughs> finds more knowledgeable people. He's like, he's going back to Gandalf right now. He's like, um, I don't think you want to get help from those guys. I didn't even know what a Barrow was. <laughs> and they thought that the shift shape shifter idea came from Tolkien. <laughs> At least the girl did. So she's well, definitely out. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so we are out of the woods and back on track in chapter right. nine. Right. All right, they have left. Um, they have left the woods. They're back on the path to the straight and narrow, as it were, mm-hmm. to Rivendell. Right. Yeah. So, what did you take away from this chapter? I and mean, what were the, some of your big takeaways? Mm, that was a big. I mean, basically, takeaways. it was all a lot about Brie. Right. Mm-hmm. And what the heck Brie was, mm-hmm. which again, very Tolkienian. What kind of people lived there? A lot of history. time. Yeah, very Tolkienian to spend a lot of yes. time explaining yes. the history of Brie and where mm-hmm. it came from, and it's been mm-hmm. it's just been around for a long time. Right. Right. Um, anything odd to you about Brie? I didn't get a good picture of the kind of people that lived there. Yeah. Uh, so they're obviously not hobbits, right? Well, there are hobbits. Well, there are some hobbits, I guess. They're kind of like. Yeah, there are some hobbits, but but the people that they talked about mainly living in Bree are taller than hobbits, right? Then they describe them as being... Well, yeah, but they're, they're men too, right? Okay, so they are men. I couldn't yeah. figure out if they were actually men or yeah. if they were some different race that we didn't know about. Yeah, they're They were men. like a hobbit-men mix. No. No. No, I don't think hobbits and men can mix. Okay. So, I, I could be wrong, but I don't know. Yeah, I thought that was kind of odd. Just how it seems to be kind there's, of there's, a, Yeah, there's definitely men, mm. and then there's hobbits. And there's hobbits, yeah, and that's unusual. Yeah. Because up until now, like, it's really hasn't been that much of a melting pot. It's no, just been, not at all. You know, hobbits here, and elves there, and dwarves somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also thought it was cool that um, they have an inn mm-hmm. at Bree. Yeah. They never talked about having an inn at the Shire. That's true. Well, the Shire doesn't really like visitors very much. You know, the Shire true. is very enclosed. So do you think Bree has an inn because of where it's located? It's kind of like on the main drag between a couple of spots where people would travel between? Yeah, I would have to assume that's that's a big part of it. I mean, yeah. um, I mean, I think in those... The the place, the, the area between Bree and then getting to Rivendell... Mm-hmm. I don't think there's much between those two places um, okay. in in terms of civilization. Right. So if you're a traveler, then you kind of have to, you know, camp. Right. If you're out between there. Okay. Um, so I think Bree is, um, you know, an inn has done has been successful there because mm-hmm. there's nothing, there's not many other places like that around. Right. Apparently, Bree is part of a little, you know, kind of um, county, as it were, of of villages. You okay. know. Um, yeah, I got that from the description um, at the beginning of the chapter. Right. Um, yeah. So they call them Bree Hobbits. That's what they call the Hobbits that live in Bree. Bree yeah. Hobbits. Well, I thought it was interesting, too, that the um, it's gated, right? Right. Like you have to get through a gate mm-hmm. to get into the village. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and maybe maybe that's how other places are too, but I didn't, you know, you think of gated communities and gated mm-hmm. neighborhoods and resorts and things like that, but an entire village being gated, I found that to be kind of interesting. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think that was more common in, you know, a- ancienter times. Okay. Right, more ancient times. To actually gate an entire village. Yeah, yeah, because you, you want to have oh, that's some... that's right, because, what was it, Brandy... Where was it that they came from? Buckland? Buckland. Had a wall around it, I guess. Well, that was to protect themselves from the old forest. Well, they, guess, they had the but... hedge. Yeah, but like, you know, yeah, just, just a way to defend in case yeah. there's... I mean... An enemy. It's just kind of like a fortification, I guess. Kind of a... Yeah. Yeah, it is... Of it, sorts. It, it it's is definitely a... unusual in these times. Well, hey, even on the uh, the bridge across the Brandywine River, apparently they had... They had a um, gate, remember? Because they were talking about could the Black Riders get through oh, the gate? Oh, that sort of that's thing. right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So I guess my answer is no. I didn't find anything very unusual about Bree. Did you? Um. I mean, no. I mean, it. it other than just hobbits and dwarves, um, other than just men and hobbits and dwarves all kind of hanging out, especially men and hobbits hanging mm-hmm. out together in this town. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, but you know, let's let's look at it real quick through Sam's eyes, because um, I really liked what they did a little bit into the chapter. Um, so, um, yeah. So let me read this passage about Sam. Okay. Um, the hobbits rode on up a gentle slope, passing a few detached houses, and drew up outside the inn. The houses looked large and strange to them. Sam stared up at the inn with its three stories and many windows and felt his heart sink. He had imagined himself meeting giants taller than trees and other creatures even more terrifying sometime or other in the course of his journey. But at the moment he was finding his first sight of men in their tall houses quite enough, indeed too much for the dark end of a tiring day. He pictured black horses standing all saddled in the shadows of the inn yard and black riders peering out of dark upper windows. "'We surely aren't going to stay here for the night, are we, sir?' he exclaimed. "'If there are hobbit folk in these parts, why don't we look for some that would be willing to take us in? It would be more homelike.'" So, you know, we don't see anything very unusual about it, but, you know, through the eyes of Sam... Sam. You're right, yeah. It's a little bit... It's a little bit terrifying. Mm -hmm. Sam's never really seen anything like this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, He's used to much smaller homes right yeah having um, holes and, and plus he's just like all I know like here we are around a bunch of big people now and all mm-hmm. I know is that the big people seem to be the people that are after us right, right? on their their the black riders right um, yeah I do now that you re- read that I do remember thinking it was strange that Sam was so uneasy yeah about it yeah but he uh, you know he seems to be a pretty insightful character so right that could have just been Tolkien's way of foreshadowing some things that were to come. Yeah, well, I, I definitely think there's, um, you know, it's just further development of Sam's character. Um, right. You know, Sam, again, is just, he's always got this little bit of, he's always kind of suspicious of different things, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just so used to things being a certain way, and uh, at every turn is something new right. for him. Yep. Um, something brand new for him. Yeah. So, well, why don't we pause there, take a quick break, okay. and we will come back and finish the rest of the chapter. Sounds like a plan. All right, don't go away. Stay tuned. Do you know the tale that Tolkien called the Colonel of the Middle-Earth mythology? Baron and Luthien is the story of an outlaw mortal and an elvish princess tasked with obtaining a Silmaril, one of the holy jewels of the Blessed Realm, from the Iron Crown of the Dark Lord Morgoth. In my new book, Tolkien's Requiem, I explore the legend of these doomed lovers. In doing so, I aim to provide a back door into the world of the Silmarillion for those who have struggled to give it a go. One of Tolkien's greatest achievements, the story of Baron and Luthien, deserves to be as well known as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Get your copy of Tolkien's Requiem today by visiting truemyths.org slash baron. That's truemyths.org slash baron. B-E-R-E-N. Happy reading. All right, and we're back. So um, so here we are. The hobbits have come, have arrived at Bree, and um, they meet Butterbur, Barleyman Butterbur, yes. who is a comical figure. Mm-hmm. Um, 
well-meaning, but yes. quite comical. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, always seems to have too much on his mind to remember the important stuff, uh, as we find out really in the next chapter. Right. Yes. Um, and so they get they get to know Barleyman. He asks them some questions, um, and and then they notice this guy Strider, um, right. who you know sitting over in the corner and asks Barleyman about him, and he seems this very mysterious figure. Yes. And you know if you're reading this for the first time and you don't know anything about the story, um, you know there's a way in which you might even think this guy might be one of the Black Riders. Oh, right? absolutely. Um, yeah. And and by the way, did you catch the part at the beginning of the chapter where as they were coming in through the gate? There was a dark figure that slipped over yes. the gate behind mm-hmm. them. Yeah. You know, very, very ominous. Yeah, um, definitely. I'm, I think that was Strider. Right? I assumed it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it could have very easily been. Yeah, for, for all we, yeah, for all you know, reading the book for the right. first time, it's mm-hmm. uh, it, it could have been anybody. Yes. Um, and we don't know that Strider is a good guy at this point. So, um, but interesting fact about Strider. Um, in the shadow. Uh, the Return of the Shadow, which is, you know, the book, the um, History of Middle Earth series. Oh, right, yeah. Um, about the Fellowship of the Ring. It uh, it reveals that Strider's original name was Trotter. Trotter. Trotter, yeah. So when you say original name, you mean when Tolkien first wrote yeah. it before yeah. he revised it? Exactly. And what's, huh. really, what's really interesting about it, I want to read this, um, in a letter, um, let me find the right letter... <coughs> sorry. Don't cough towards the microphone, oh, I'm please. I'm so sorry. Sorry, everyone. Oh, I am. My apologies. Sorry, you had to hear Greta coughing up a lung. <laughs> All right. That's what it sounds like. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let's see. So, um, in a letter of, looks like 19, it was a long one, um, to W.H. Auden, of all people, who is a, uh, who is a poet and critic of the mid-20th century, American, um, a well-known one. Um, you're going to find him in like poetry anthologies and that kind of thing. Um, so a letter of 19, June of 1955 to W.H. Auden, at the very end of the letter, he says, uh, But I met a lot of things on the way that astonished me. Tom Bombadil I knew already, but I had never been to Bree. Strider sitting in the corner at the end was a shock, and I had no more idea who he was than had Frodo. So I love what this says about Tolkien, mm-hmm. Tolkien's creative process because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously like anybody who's writing a book, he has some idea where he where he wants to go with the book. Right. But then he gets to Bree, and he, first of all, he discovers Bree, and right. he's like, "Where did this come from?" Because uh, it's not in the Hobbit, right? They, you know, they took. Okay, the I same, was going to ask about that. No, they it's took not. they took okay. the same road in the Hobbit, which is interesting because actually in one of the Peter Jackson Hobbit movies, he includes Bree in it. Oh. Um, which is, it's actually. Um, it's not not as part of the actual story he includes in a prologue, which is actually fine. Okay. Um, but Tolkien didn't know what Brie was when he wrote The Hobbit, hmm. and he didn't discover what it was until much later in writing The Lord of the Rings. And um, so, not only did he not know what Brie was, but he did not know who the Strider guy was. So Strider, he he brings him into Brie to the Prancing Pony, and. Here's this Strider guy who he called Trotter at the time, sitting in the corner, hmm. right? And he's like, "Who is this guy?" You know, and so that he is just so funny. Yeah, well, and it's just great that that's. I mean, that's how the Hobbit really started, right? He was just like mm-hmm. he had this thought in his head, like in a hole in a hole in the ground there lived a Hobbit, and he wrote it on the back of like an exam paper he was grading, you know, and that's how that's how Hobbits oh, came to be, started. right? That's amazing. But you know, I just I love that because mm-hmm. you know it really you really get a sense that Tolkien at the end of the day, did not view himself as like, oh, I am this master artist and creator, right. you know. Right. Just like kind of really pretentious mm-hmm. sort of mentality of um, of like the artist and that kind right. of thing. Right, yeah. He viewed himself just as like, just on this like journey of discovery of mm-hmm. this other world that mm-hmm. that was there in his mind. Right. And, um, and he was willing to be surprised by it. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't so... He wasn't so locked in to his vision or ideas or, you know, he didn't, he, he, he wasn't, he was willing to, to just go with the flow. Yeah. Right. And, you know, he didn't have any premeditated, calculated visions of exactly how it was going to be. Yeah. Like he was, he was willing to just take it one letter at a time. Yeah. I mean, right? I think that style of, I think that's, that 
ethos of creativity mm. is really wonderful and beautiful mm-hmm. because I think it's so, you know, it's easy to want to have to be like this is where I'm going right, right. with my art. This is the story I'm telling. Right. And um, and I feel like sometimes like in a sense you have to do that but it's some t- it, on some level too you have to be willing to surrender it to something else right. and yeah. be like well that's not really where it needs to go right or not fully where it needs to go right um, I mean just so, so much of the weirdness of this first part of the Lord of the Rings is just like including Tom Bombadil in there you yeah. know um, I mean who else would have done that like that's just that's not even normal for most that kind of thing is not even normal for most fantasy novels right. you know like right. um people generally want to cut to the chase you know like let's get to the action yes. and he's like including this weird yeah. vow of poverty Tom Bombadil guy in the yeah. story and then um, but you know even as I'm like writing a song sometimes you know you you want this like if I'm writing a song and I'm like oh it's got to be this that, you know and then at some point I'm just like no it really needs to go this direction or I just I just stumble upon something like a mm-hmm. you know a guitar tone when I'm trying to make the song sound the way I think it should sound and I'm like oh wait mm-hmm. maybe this is the direction it should go and I go that way and I'm like mm-hmm. oh yeah this actually works a lot better mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and I don't need all that like actually all the other stuff would have been a huge distraction this is right. what the song really needs to be right so it's I don't know yeah. it's just um I think it's just this joyful aspect of artistry to feel like you're you're collaborating with um with a, with your muse, right? Mm-hmm. You're you know in a sense collaborating with God, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. As you as you create these things, and it's very in keeping with his Tolkien's idea of subcreation as well. Right. Know, right. What we read it about is. in Mythopoeia. Yeah. Um, it's very. I feel like it's very intrinsic. It's very natural. Yeah. Like it's just a natural progression. It's just completely unadulterated. You know, or calculated. It's just free flowing. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. I Man, I don't, I've I can tell you, I've started making dinner on countless nights with a particular thing. I'm going to make this. Mm-hmm. And by the time I'm done, it doesn't look a thing like what I planned right. on making because I was like, oh, let's yeah. try putting some of this in or that. And, yeah. and sit down to eat and you're like, what is this? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the thing too is that, like what you, what you said, if you don't, if you have no idea where you're going, it's not likely to turn out well. No, no, But if no. you start out and you're you like, well, this is what I'm going to do, but then you're like, well, right. maybe what if I try doing this? Right. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Um, I you feel have inspired kind of to a, do this. Yeah. yeah, you have kind of an overall big picture idea, but the little details you're willing to, yeah. to mess with, you know. Yeah, and it's just that, the, uh, you know, it's that, uh, do you remember when we went to um, the Over the Rhine concert at their farm, and mm-hmm. they had the signs up that said, uh, keep the edges wild or leave the edges wild or, or whatever? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. That's what I think of when I think of this, mm-hmm. you know, it's like just leave the loose ends loose ends and don't right. try and tie every little bit up right um anyway there's something think, up to the imagination i just think it's cool he discovered yeah strider just that he wasn't randomly he, he was wasn't just like originally a part of the story and there's this guy sitting over here and his name's <laughs> trotter you know and, I, d- I'm, I am really thankful that he changed his name from trotter to strider i am too <laughs> i am too but they're related though right like a trot and a stride yeah 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 um but it's real. It's really funny to me because, as we'll see as we continue through the trilogy, I mean, he's like a central character in all the books, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? I mean, he's not like a Tom Bombadil guy who's here for a chapter or two and then gone, right? I mean, this is like he plays a huge part. Oh yeah. In the entire length of the story. Right. Right. So that's really funny to me that he had no, you know, that he didn't have him planned out from the beginning. Yeah. I think that's great though. It is, uh, but it also speaks to Tolkien's Tolkien's incredible talent, right? Mm-hmm. And as a writer, I mean, to be able to just discover somebody and then work them in mm-hmm. as a main character in all the books, I mean, that takes some some serious uh, some serious talent. Yeah, for sure. Some serious writing prowess, storytelling. Um, yeah, definitely. We are in total agreement. Um, well, good. Cause I don't like it when you disagree with me. Yeah, well. I'm just saying. I'm glad you agree with me. Yeah, me too. I'm glad I am glad I agree <laughs> with me too. And you're glad that I'm glad. <laughs> I'm happy that you're happy. <laughs> okay? Okay. Um, so, um, any other thoughts on the, the man in the moon 
poem? I know we talked. you talked about that as your favorite passage. Any other? Um, I don't think so. I just thought it was really playful and fun and witty mm-hmm. and clever. Um, I was wondering, though, so right before he they actually get into the song, it, the little preface there says that um, here, here it is in full, but as a rule, only certain... What does it say? It says, like, but as a rule, only certain parts are known or something like that. It says, oh, only a few words of it are now, as a rule, remembered. Hmm. Is that, why is, like, what does that mean? You say, is that before it? Yeah, it's right before it starts. It says, here it is in full, but most, it's not usually remembered in full, right? It says only a few words of it are now, as a rule, remembered. Well, I... Does it mean like there's a rule, like part of it's been banned, or is it just that it's just fallen from memory for most people? That's a good question. I'm not sure what he means, but I think maybe what he's saying is um, uh, like these are the ones that we're certain of. These are the words that we're certain of, you know, in terms of being a rule. Oh, okay. Um, Well, he says that here it is in full, though. Right? It says here um, it is in full. Hey, it's not, we don't need to get Oh, to oh yeah, okay. Okay, here's the poem in full. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I'm not exactly sure what that means. I hadn't thought about that. Because I understand, like, if it's not popular and if, you know, it just gets forgotten and not passed down or whatever. But now it says as a rule. Yeah. So it's almost like it's against the law, right? <laughs> to remember the whole thing. <laughs> Thou shalt it's not too say long. the man the moon poem. It's too long. You may only remember the first four stanzas. Right. But no, I really liked it. I thought it was really, like I guess I just thought it was really clever and funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is fun, yeah. It would be fun just to kind of do a deep dive on that at some point. Um, yeah. Along with all the other good. poems in here. Yeah, it would be fun to write a tune for it, too. Yeah. And then come up with a dance Right. for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That would be super fun. Um... All right, well, there is the ring incident, so just after yes. the Man in the Moon poem. Yes. Um, he was trying to jump over the moon, wasn't he, Frodo? Frodo felt, yeah. Um, uh, they made Frodo have another drink and then began <laughs> and then begin his song again while many of them joined in. For the tune was well known, and they were quick at picking up words. It was now Frodo's turn to feel pleased with himself. He capered about on the table, and when he came a second time to the cow jumped over the moon, he leaped in the air. Much too vigorously, for he came down, bang, into a tray full of mugs, and slipped and rolled off the table with a crash, clatter, and bump. The audience all opened their mouths wide for laughter, and stopped short in gaping silence, for the singer disappeared. He simply vanished, as if he had gone slap through the floor without leaving a hole. You know what they call that, John? What? A party foul. Party foul? Big time party foul. I don't know. That would have been a pretty sweet thing to see at a party. (laughs) I just disappear. Yeah. Yeah, but he made kind of a mess. That's in true. His wake. That's true. Yeah, it is a party foul. You're right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But it said before that that he had been the ring had been kind of beckoning for him. Yeah, right? yeah. Like he I, felt was, I was I was going to ask you about that. So. Yeah. It, uh, one paragraph later, it says Frodo felt a fool, not knowing what else to do. He crawled away under the tables to the dark corner by Strider, who sat unmoved, giving no sign of his thoughts. Frodo leaned back against the wall and took off the ring. How it, how it came to be on his finger, he could not tell. He could only suppose that he had been handling it in his pocket while he sang, and that somehow it had slipped on when he stuck out his hand with a jerk to save his fall. For a moment, he wondered if the ring itself had not played him a trick. Perhaps it had tried to reveal itself in response to some wish or command that was felt in the room. He did not like the looks of the men that had gone out. Well, even before that, though, mm-hmm. even before he started his song, it, it says... It talks about how he he felt the ring on its chain, and quite unaccountably, the desire came over him to slip it on yeah. and vanish out of this silly situation. So it's and it seemed ri- to, it, and furthermore, yeah, it seemed to him somehow as if the suggestion came to him from outside, mm. from someone or something in the room. Right. So he had already was starting to work on him, mm-hmm. and then the fall just kind of made it happen yeah I guess. well it's it's just funny because it's using 
his you know his desire to stay anonymous and stay and right. be inconspicuous against mm-hmm. him right mm-hmm. which is a good desire again right you know because he's obviously in danger right um and it's like oh come on just put me on and then that'll fix your problem you'll be invisible right 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 and it's funny that it says um he resisted the temptation to put it on firmly and clasped the ring in his hand as if to keep a hold on it and prevent it from escaping or doing any mischief um so Mm -hmm. his response to this temptation is to firmly resist it but then to grip the ring ever tighter right yeah and you just see how subtle how subtle it really is right and it's how subtle its devices are because it's using all of these desires and it's like but he's got to hang but he's got to hang on to it at the same time right? right he he has this responsibility for it right he is the the steward of the ring as it were and if it gets out of his hands who he's failed right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so but at the same time by grasping it like that he's totally setting himself up yeah but but you see how it's no it's working its way into his fight because absolutely he's got all of these good motives right 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 yeah but i mean i know you're with me but i'm I'm just kind of drawing it out further but right um He's got all these good motives, but it's just like he can't win, right? Yeah. He's like, it's just, it's further and further grabbing a hold of him, and you can see how the, the precious mentality develops, mm-hmm. right? Right, yeah. You know? Yeah, that's absolutely um, true. It, it can go from being like, I have I have an errand to keep with this, you know, to, to go do with this ring, and it's, and it's a very important errand, mm-hmm. to eventually becoming like, this is mine, right? Yes, yes. I've kept it all this way. I deserve mm-hmm. it, right? Mm-hmm. How that mm-hmm. could how that could gradually slip in, right? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it does how the ring works, right? It exploits your good intentions, mm-hmm. and it, it plays on, it totally plays on those. And then isn't the um, cause it says in there he felt like the the temptation was coming from outside. So yeah. is is that temptation stronger when? say the black riders are near or i mean can't because i felt like i remembered something where if the black riders are near they can like play these mind games right where Mm -hmm. they can basically will the ring to behave in a certain way because by him putting on the ring by frodo putting on the ring it helps them Mm -hmm. it helps to expose him yeah to them right right? so um so can't when the black riders are near is the temptation to use the ring greater do you think um sorry something weird just happened with my phone there's a moth obsessed with the flashlight I know, that's on why I'm trying phone. to turn it off <laughs> there we go go away moth um say your question again please okay. sorry <laughs> that I was moth distracted. really kind of distracted you I was asking about the black riders and is the temptation or the effect of the ring may be stronger when they're around can I they think, influence it somehow I think so I think that's what's being yeah. That's what's being that's implied. That's what's being hinted at. Okay. Um, I don't know exactly the mechanism for it, but okay. I think they they have an influence and are able to kind of call to it or get it to call to them or right um, to do things that will well. And um, I guess this, we don't we don't want to get into that yet, probably because I think that's the next chapter. Um, but we're going to talk more about the Black Riders and yeah, we'll talk about will. the next chapter. Yeah. Um, and the way they work, but yeah. Uh, all right. Any more thoughts on this chapter, Greta? No, I thought the ending was pretty cool. Yeah. Kind of a nice cliffhanger. Yeah. Right? Because they, like, they, they somehow get out of the whole, you know, um, party foul situation. And they're like, oh, phew, now we get to go just relax and recuperate and mm-hmm. get up our energy for tomorrow. And then they go into their room and isn't... Oh, maybe that's the next chapter. Next chapter. My bad. I'm sorry. Nice one, Greta. Uh, I'm embarrassed now. Anyway, um, no, I liked the chapter. I found it. I found it very entertaining. Yeah, it's much a, more entertaining than the last couple chapters. Yeah, it's an entertaining chapter. Um, yeah, still the pace hasn't quite picked up, and it won't actually until towards the end of this book one. It's getting a little bit quicker, though. I a little feel bit, like. yeah. There's more stuff happening. Yeah. At least we're back on the main road at this point. Right. And isn't it after... Oh, okay. So it's it's actually Strider who suggests to Frodo that he do something mm-hmm. to distract people away from 
Pippin. Right. Right. Okay. So he actually his first interaction with Strider is before the whole disappearing act. Right. Okay. And of course, Strider says it would probably been better if you hadn't done. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think we. uh, Yeah. Maybe we should have done something different. That call. Yeah. All right. We need to do something. You did. For sure. It's just that. He, the intent was to do something that was going to make the situation better, not worse. Right. <laughs> and for her to do something to make it worse. This happens sometimes. It does happen. The best intentions can sometimes mm-hmm. go awry. Yes. And it's a true story. Yeah. Right on. All right. All right. Well, so here's the deal. Um, so the next couple of episodes are actually, we're going to be um, taking a break from our reading for the next two episodes. Um uh, and those will actually be um, kind of a little um, special um, special episode, special treat. Um, so after this episode? Yeah. Okay. And then um, following those next two episodes, so episodes 32 and... No, I'm sorry. Yeah, episodes 32 and 33 will I be... this is episode 32. This is 31. Oh, my bad. I think this is 31. Now I'm confused. Um, yeah, this is 31. Okay. Yeah, and then episodes 32 and 33 will be a little change up, uh, and then episode 34, which should come out towards the end of August, will be a return to Lord of the Rings with um, chapter 10. Um, and so from here on out, we're going to slow down the pace a little bit um, so that we can start dealing with some other stuff um, hmm. on on other weeks. Okay. So going. Uh, Going two episodes without reading is going to be unusual, and that's just a special circumstance because of some stuff we have going on. And then starting with episode 34, we'll basically be going every other week reading, and then on the on the opposite weeks. So basically, even numbered episodes will be a reading, okay. right? A chapter, chapter reading. reading. Okay. Um, and then odd numbered episodes will be special stuff. Like nice. discussions on special topics, Tolkien-related topics, or, um, you know, whatever we want to talk about related to Tolkien. I like so, that. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. So, that'd be the plan. I, uh, I think it's a good one, Johnny. Sweet. Yeah. Hopefully our listeners agree. I hope so. I mm-hmm. hope so. Um, so. But, hey, we are all about um, taking long walks in Middle Earth on oh, the show. you know it. So. Yep. Um. You know, we just don't want to. Uh, we just don't want to work ourselves to death, get kind of making our way too fast through it, and, right. that, and that sort of thing. Right. So. We we wanna we wanna just make it last. You know, mm-hmm. spread it out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, and with that note, uh, now the helicopters are coming to take us yes. away. So <laughs> we've That's gone too ride. long, apparently. So uh, yeah. We should probably sign off. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to you later, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. After recording this episode, I decided on a slight change of plan. The next episode, to be released on August 17th, will be a special edition of the Tolkien Road. After that, we will continue our discussion of The Lord of the Rings with Chapter 10, Strider. That episode will be released on August 24th. Please tune in, and until next time, the road goes ever on.